Alright, so today we are very happy to have uh, Lawrence Everhart from the Institute to tell us about 3D gravity and tech molar space, the tech molar TFT. All right, thanks very much everyone for coming and for the invitation. And so today I'll talk about uh, 3D quantum gravity. Uh, it's not maybe my usual topic, so many, maybe not as a string theorist, so if people want to uh, chat about that uh, afterwards in private, I'm also very happy. Um, right, so the work I'll uh, presenting is in collaboration with Scott Collier, who's a postdoc in Princeton, and Meng Yang Zhang, who's a graduate student in Princeton. And um, so what we're trying to cl clarify and uh, make it more useful, maybe, is that there's this old relation between 3D quantum gravity and SH Wart and Simon theory. Uh, by the way, I should apologize, I will not write any references on the board. I'll try to say them, but just to save time. Um, so this was first discussed by Witten and then subsequently by many other authors. And uh, the sort of problem with this correspondence, uh, there are at least two problems. One is that neither side of the correspondence is understood, and the second problem is also that it's wrong, this correspondence. And I'll tell you why. I mean, it's also kind of well known that it's wrong, and uh, I'll tell you in a, in a bit why it's wrong. And um, of course, eventually, we would like that quantum gravity has anything to say about the ADCFT correspondence. There should be something maybe like a dual CFT or CFT ensemble. But I think the jury is still out on whether uh, some precise proposal can be made for the boundary description. And so, what I want to explain today is basically an improvement on this correspondence um, that, really, that replaces SL2 times SL2 transcendence theory with a slightly different uh, TQFT. And it has been known in the math literature under the name of Teichmer TQFT. But as far as I know, there's exactly one physics paper written on this uh, theory. Um, but the nice thing about this TQFT is that it's actually much better understood than SH Torch and Simon's theory. So you can actually use it and compute things here uh, in order to do many computations in, in gravity that are otherwise difficult or, as far as I know, impossible. So, far to do. so it's kind of a nice overarching framework to. Uh, Unify various uh, different approaches to 3D gravity. Okay, so uh, I'll start. Basically, these first two points here are just a review of known things. So there won't be a lot of new things, uh, but maybe I'm just putting in uh, together various pieces. So I will first discuss the, the phase space of uh, 3D gravity, and then we're going to quantize it, which is uh, known how to do. And then we will see how it's related to this cache community QFT. And finally, in order to demonstrate that it's really useful, I'll uh, go through a number of examples and where we actually compute it. And also, since I want it to be relatively informal, uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have any comments or questions. So, a uh, very quick question. So, which physics paper first talk about this? Uh, it's uh, by Mikhailov. He was Edward's student at some point, and now he moved out of physics. Uh, as far as I know, this, I mean, there, there are Papers before that, like, kind of touch on the topic, but uh, oh, that's where they know, he, like, nobody. Like, but that was when he was talking about the supergroup uh, transcendence theory. Mm, that's a different paper by the same author. Okay. Uh, the paper is called Teichmann TQFT versus SA Torch and Sense theory. So he wants to uh, make this relation more precise. Yeah, so, so you will see what the difference between the two theories is. So let's start uh, by discussing the phase space. So I'll start uh, very passively. Um, and so the main idea between this course, uh, behind this correspondence is that uh, gravity in three dimensions you can describe in first order formalism and basically you can describe it in terms of the drive band that you have and the spin connection, usually spin connection has two indices but in three dimensions you have a levi chi symbol so you can realize it, make it one index. So you can make these linear combinations and L here is the ADS length, so it's related to a cosmological concept like this. And um, if you form these combinations, then basically a mu plus and minus, they transform like SA2R gauge fields. So these you should think of as SA2R gauge fields. And under uh, local Lorentz rotations in the, in the uh, frame of the drive band and uh, the small different multiples. And you can also check that the Einstein Hilbert action uh, becomes just the action of two couple of transcendence theories. And so that leads to the claim, and, and let me also write the level. So the level of the transcendence theory is basically set by the length of uh, ADS and then the usual conventions. And this is equal to the center charge over six, where C is the brown handle center charge of the boundary. Um, right. 
And so now let me mention the problems because I, I claim maybe slightly cheaply that this first one is, is wrong. So what are the problems? Um, so there are essentially three problems, I would say. So the first one is that um, here on the gravity side, there is a condition that the metric needs to be invertible. So usually we say, or even positive definite. And on the gauge theory side, we could have the gauge field being anything. There's no constraint whatsoever. In particular, the gauge field could be zero. That corresponds to zero drag back, which is very bad. So, um, so if you just pass naively to this uh, transcendence formalism, you would integrate, if you do the path integral, you would integrate over many gauge field configurations, of course, that would look, look extremely similar in the gravity. And uh, usually, if we try to interpret our gravity somehow semi classically, we don't want that. So, this will be the problem that will be cured uh, in, in this tech. Uh, tech we'll see why. Um, second problem is that in, in gravity, uh, this is maybe conceptually a little bit more difficult to understand, uh, we gauge uh, all the different morphisms, right? And usually, if some manifold, it can have small diffeomorphisms and have large diffeomorphisms. You know this very well in 2D. If you have, say, some uh, CFT on the torus, then the large diffeomorphisms are just modular transformations. And if we do gravity, we want to gauge by these modular transformations. This is the reason why, in string theory, we're not integrating over the upper half plane for the one loop amplitudes, but just over the fundamental domain, because we gauge this as a 2Z group. Um, and so in gravity, we gauge uh, this, this mapping class group. And in general, the mapping class group on some manifold is uh, given by the group of all diffeomorphisms, and then you model the small diffeomorphisms. Small diffeomorphisms are those you can continuously deform to the identity. So this is some discrete group, usually. And on gravity side, you gauge it. But on gauge theory side, you don't gauge it. Usually. And so there's, if you just maybe pass to the gauge theory, then you forget that you should divide by this map. Okay, and the third one is maybe the most obvious one I left for last, is in gravity we should sum over topologies, whereas um, we only fix our boundary conditions, where usually in gauge theory we put some background manifold and then we consider the, the gauge field of it. Okay, from, from these problems, I mean, at least to me, it seems like one is the most hard to cure, whereas three you can just do by hand, basically you sum over topologies in the end, and uh, two, you have to divide by this mapping class group, which usually has some subtleties because typically, I mean, often this mapping class group is not a finite group. If it would just be finite, it would be very easy to take care of. <clears throat> okay. Ask, that, this in my view, there was also always a problem because gravity, something which, theory which naturally is in the classical level, is it to couple to any Lorentz invariant quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. And in this formalism, that's hard because it breaks part of this gauge symmetry. So in the formulation which you have, will it be equally hard or it will be? I think it's equally hard because it's, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't have anything useful to say how to couple to matter because it's very cu cu crucial for this that this is a TQFT and not some, some oh, but more But TQFT can sometimes be coupled to yeah. convention. So um, basically, yeah, I'm asking, is there a natural way to couple the TQFT to CFT, for instance? Yeah, not, there... the, not that I know of, but maybe. Uh, but, but yeah, that, this is kind of important that we're talking only about pure gravity. Um, all right, here. So um, now since uh, I want to discuss the phase space, what I'm imagining is that I have some this part of some three-dimensional manifold where I'm fixing some spatial size, so some spatial size, some Riemann surface. And it's closed. It, it is, uh, the manifold is, uh, well, for the purpose of discussing the phase space, it doesn't really matter. So I'm just discussing the, all the, the space of initial conditions I can put on my spatial side. Well, but when uh, if you have a boundary instead of a puncture, then the space is simply dimensional because there is this loop. But if you're more mapping the location of the um, second boundary. That's right. But I mean, that's a yeah, I mean, well, so, so here I'm discussing so the Ryan signature. We will go to Euclidean signature in a moment. So the manifold is necessarily non compact so you can literally take it to be sigma times. No, I'm simply saying that if you have ADS, ADS is a boundary, take a constant time section. Oh, in that sense it's closed. Yeah, it is right. closed in that sense, yes. Um, right. And, well, uh, 
I could in principle have things like uh, conical defects, and which would be roughly like what's the ninth in this in this case theory. But let's not do it. Uh, I doubt that might be the case. Okay. Um, so the transcendent space space. Uh, it's very standard, so it's the space of all flat gauge fields uh, on this initial value surface. So in this case, it will be flat SFR bundles. So this is some moduli space of flat bundles and square. It's uh, two copies of it. I'm not very precise here what I want SFR, PSFR, universal cover of SFR, or what I want. Um, let me put PSFR. So uh, if you do PSI2R, then it's known that this, this space is actually disconnected space. It has several connected components, and the components are labeled by some topological number. That's the order number. The reason for this, uh, you know, some topology, because as PSI2R contracts to a circle, it's S1. If you have an S1 fiber, there's, uh, there's like a first term class or order number number you can define, but it's not completely arbitrary because there's a condition that as a psa 2 r bundle, the bundle needs to be flat. So there's some inequality on this order number, it's bounded from below and above by the order characters. So there's some finite number of disconnected components of this space. And um, so yeah. if you allow punctures, you can go arbitrarily high. Uh, if you allow punctures, this order characters will include the puncture. So it adds one. Um, and um, so there's one special component which is the one with highest Euler, uh, Euler class and uh, so this is called Heitmerer space it's Heitmerer space, let, let me give this a name the smaller space of five bundles, let's call it M is it R and then there's a special component in this smaller space which is Heitmer space. And the special thing about this is that whenever you have some hyperbolic surface, uh, yes? Is it somehow obvious that this special component is unique? Like, can we have two components? It is uh, not entirely uh, obvious. Uh, so yeah, it's defined by having the maximal order number. Yeah. But what's not obvious is that there's, uh, that the degenerates, mm -hmm. so it is actually known that every order number this is, so if you restrict yourself to a particular order number, the space is connected. Um, and okay, so, okay, so this one connected. So the number of connected components is something like number of order, order number plus one, two times order number plus one. Is there a maximal or maximal absolute value? Yeah, so there's a maximal, there's also a minimal one. Yeah. The minimal one is isomorphic to this by orientation reverse. Makes sense. And basically what you want to do is you want, uh, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. But so the, the Teichmere space is the, so if you have some hyperbolic metric on some Riemann surface, then you automatically get a flat at PSA4 button because the tangent bundle carries a psa 2 uh, bundle structure, if you have a hyperbolic metric, and it is flat. And so there's always, given some hyperbolic metric on your Riemann surface, you get a point in Teichmer space. And uh, the statement is that Teichmer space is precisely, corresponds precisely to that subset that has a geometric interpretation in terms of metrics on your Riemann surface. So this, you can think of as being the geometric component of psa 2 bundles. So this T, is a one-to-one -one correspondence with hyperbolic metrics. Oh, non singular. Yes, non singular. Except you might have decided that you want some Wilson line and then you have some conical defect and then you will have the conical defect also on the Um Right, and so in fact, Teichmere space is very simply related to the modular space of Riemann surfaces. It's just a universal cover. So you need to. And um, so now what the statement is that is made, uh, has been made a couple of times in the literature is that gravity phase space uh, let's call it M graph it's just two copies of this edge in the space. So you have the left moving one and the right moving one. Uh, I put the bar because for the right one, moving one you should take the one with the lowest order number. This was stated, I mean, Massimo in particular has a paper on it. But like in a mathematical literature, it's I think the first by Krasnov Schlenker and Krasnov Scaricini. And uh, so there's a non-trivial statement also that you can prove now. So when you have some 
some metric that is in this initial um, um, initial phase space and you compute what the 3D metric is, then you will want not only the 2D metric to be smooth, but you want the full 3D metric to be smooth. And that's a non-trivial mathematical theorem that you can prove. But, I mean, what we did also was to put the boundary because then the boundary again adds a component that's right. multi-dimensional but universal. Right. right. Uh, I think in particular so this Krasnov's current is like, uh, the, it's called the universal, uh, I mean, they're, they're also looking at the disk and then it's the universal type of all right, um, good. That's what I wanted to say for the uh, phase space. And by the way, I should also make a comment. Some people divide uh, the phase space further by the mapping class group of the 2D surface. So there's a, a, again, the mapping class group you can think of as being modular transformations. If T would be if the surface, if the sigma would be a torus, it's just modular transformations. And um, by the so, diagonal? By the yeah. diagonal one, yeah, that's right. And um, so this is always good when your 3D manifold is say of the form like some Riemann surface times S1, because then the 3D mapping class group is the same as the 2D mapping class group. And then you just want to compute the trace over that Hilbert space that you get from quantizing that phase space modded out by the mapping class group. So you have a choice that you either first quantize this phase space and then mod out by the mapping class group later, or you first mod out and then you quantize. And it's often more useful, at least for us, it will be more useful to quantize this one and then mod out later. But you find different things in the future. Okay. All right, let's quantize it. And um, so this also has all been done. So basically, the problem reduces to quantizing Teichmüller space. And when I mean quantizing Teichmüller space, Teichmüller space is a symplectic manifold, it's non compact. It's symplectic and it carries this Y Peterson volume form. That's a symplectic structure. And so if you, it's known that if you quantize T, what you get is a Hilbert space. And basically, uh, quantization means that you need to promote, promote, you should think of T as being like the space of all momentum positions. So you want some wave functions that depend roughly speaking on half of the coordinates of T. And a convenient thing to do if your space, this space is actually a complex space, uh, there's Keller quantization, which means that you can take your wave function to be a holomorphic function on this uh, phase space. And function is not quite accurate. What you actually want is some section of some line bundle, but I don't want to get into it. But basically what the wave functions will be uh, are holomorphic functions that depend on type of space. And uh, if you think about it, you know such nice set of functions. And what it is, is zero zero conformal blocks. Okay, so I should, uh, because the Virazor conformal block, it depends on a complex structure on the surface, but uh, it's not necessarily crossing symmetric in the sense that, so for example, if uh, you're in some four puncture sphere, then you usually write down some S channel block, but then it's a non trivial condition for a CFT to be crossing symmetric. So the conformal block itself is not crossing symmetric, which means that it's not a function on modular space, but it's a function on the universal cover of modular space, which is type of space. And this line bundle business you can also see here. Uh, the fact that this is not a function on Teichmüller space means that the conformal block is also not a function because there is a conformal anomaly. Because you have to choose some metric, it depends explicitly on the metric. Um, and so that's kind of natural that something this should be true. And this was made precise by, uh, well, first one that said that something like this should be true is Berlinde. And then there was uh, work in the math literature by Kashev, and then Teschner worked on it uh, from roughly 2005. Uh, 2002, 2005. And um, I should also be a little bit more precise. Uh, there is also an inner product, because if you quantize, you don't just get the vector space, but you get Hilbert space. And the inner product you can write down that follows from this quantization procedure. So if you have two conformal blocks, you can take the inner product. And the way it works is that um, you somehow need to get a number out of two blocks. So how do you do this? Uh, what you can do is you can try to integrate them over tight mirror space. So you should be uh, under homomorphic in this one and homomorphic in this one. Something like this, right? That's what you would naively write down. That's, of course, not well defined, which we know from, say, string theory. Because in string theory, we're basically doing the same integral. We're integrating over modular space, not over tight mirror space, but locally it's the same. 
we know in order for this integral to make sense, the integrand needs to transform like a CFT partition function of central charge 26. And so what you need to do is you multiply it by some other partition function uh, whose central charge is 26 minus C. Um, so this, this C here is uh, still the same C. And this one typically is very big, and so this one will be typically negative central charge. And then you also need your BC goes to make this work. So it's basically the same integral that you would do in some kind of string theory, but it's not completely model invariant because the, the conformal blocks are not model invariant, so you need to integrate over all of tight functions. And for the z of 26 minus c, what theory should it be? So it basically needs to be some theory that exists for all values of the central charge continuously, and the central charge is usually less than some very negative number. And the only theory that we know that exists uh, is a so-called time-like global theory. So that part was not particularly clear in, in Berliner's paper, but the only, so when you take this theory to be time-like global theory, then this procedure uh, seems to work. And also, if this uh, conformal block has some puncture, so if, if it's like a full point block, block on the sphere, then you also need to take a correlation function in this theory. And basically, the vertex operator that you need to choose here are such, like in string theory, such that you get like kind of vertex operators from here, and the external conformal weight has to add up to one, just like the mass like conditions. So it's a much like string theory, except that you're not uh, integrating with more vertex. Does the time like Google theory have spinning operators? Uh, no. So how do you deal with the um, insertions which are uh, yeah, let me tell you what, what this uh, the conformal block actually is, uh, this inner product is. So we have a very explicit formula for it. Uh, so this is kind of the abstract definition. But uh, at least one, one of our contributions is to actually evaluate this. So you can evaluate it in several different ways. Um, one way, for example, is to interpret this as a string theory and think about it in, from a, some kind of target space perspective. In target space, this look like Feynman diagrams in target space. So there should be like a product of three point functions and a um, So let's just take it for a four point block. Uh, we could do it for anything. So they're labeled by, uh, should, this is some parameterization that people often use in this business of the center charge. You write the center charge through this parameter B, and you write conformal weights as. Um, Q squared over four, which is the same as C minus one over 24, plus P squared. Okay, it's often useful to use this parameter P. And so, so the external ones need to be the same because this is part of the data that you define, uh, used to define your tight mirror space basically. And then you, if you take this inner product, so first of all, the inner product is only really well-defined, so that's quite easy to see um, when, all the states, at least the internal states, need to be bigger than c minus one over twenty-four. Otherwise, this you know this integral just diverges because we're integrating over some non-compact space, so it's not guaranteed that it converges. So the normalizable blocks are only the ones that you see, say, in Dilbert theory, where uh, all the internal states need to be heavier than c minus one over twenty-four, and that translates in terms of this p, saying that this p is real. And now you can evaluate this explicitly. And basically, because of the reason that Defang said, uh, there cannot be any spinning uh, thing. So the p here and here has to be the same, because also it's not there in time like the other theory. And then, OK, so um, what you get here. It's basically a delta function, but there's some non-trivial measure. And the C0 is the DOZZ structure constant in some convenient normalization. And rho zero is, is uh, the two-point function of the normalization. And um, so I did prepare something. Um, so I just like, uh, in order to convince you that everything is kind of uh, well-defined and so on, uh, I just wrote down what these things are. So rho zero is some, some very standard function. It's just a same product of two cinches. Uh, so it's the natural measure that you get on um, this kind of group. It's not that this comes as some control measure on the Verizoro group. And this uh, C0 is, is, uh, is basically the DOZZ formula in this normalization. Um, 
and you get one over C zero for the experts because in time like Lyapunov theory, basically the structure constants are kind of roughly one over the space like structure. Um, so we can derive this fairly explicitly, and you can also check that it's positive definitely. So if all the p's are real, this this measure here is positive. So the theory is unitary. You're going to need to kill this thing. Okay, cool. So that's basically the proceeding the, the result of the quantization. If you quantize, you get all the zero conformal blocks with that uh, inner product structure. If it would be just for that, it's kind of manifestly useless because just giving some input space with an inner product it doesn't buy you much. So you need some more structure. You, 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 so far, there is no mapping class group, so you repeat. Yeah, that's what I'm story. going to do now. Um, right, so, so now the um, nice uh, thing is that the Hilbert space carries more structure because we know, for example, that uh, conformal blocks behave nicely under applying crossing transformations. So there's a, in, in fancy terms, it means that there is a mapping class group, uh, sorry, mapping group. Action on this Hilbert space because uh, every like a crossing transformation you can think of as being a mapping class group action. It's not quite true. It's it's a little bit more complicated, but roughly speaking, that. And uh, for example, what you can do is you can take a four puncture block like this. And you could try to expand it in the opposite channel, in the T-channel. So there's also braiding and so on, so I'm slightly simplifying. But basically, you can expand this in this channel. And there's some object here that comes. So let's, let me call this PS and this PT. And then there's some object PS, PT, P1, P2, P3, P4. So you know that all your zero conformal blocks are a complete set of states in the Hilbert space. And the quantization should be the same, depend, no matter on what frame of reference you quantize, which in particular means that all the deconformal blocks in this channel, all the normalizable ones, can be expressed in terms of the other channel, this piece. And the kind of amazing fact about this um, is that even though conformal blocks are kind of complicated objects, and there's no closed form formula in some sense for it, there's a closed form formula for this f. Um, so we don't really know what we're transforming, but we know how it transforms. And uh, the formula, I mean, I said it's closed form, but it's kind of complicated. And I just wrote it uh, for completeness. So it's a little bit like the DOZ structure constants. You see the same kind of special functions appearing. This is like the double gamma function that you need for the DOZ structure constant and some bunch of those. But then you also need an integral over those. So these SP are ratios of these gamma things. Um, and you see it's fairly complicated, uh, but it's, a, it's known in the math literature that this is some kind of some kind of BD form have a geometric function. If you take B to zero, this goes back to the Men and Barnes representation of hypergeometric functions, if you know what that is. But the main message is that these objects are known. And we want to use them uh, to compute things. Okay. Um, right. And what you can check now is that you can define this F, and there's also like a braiding move, and there's also a you also need transformation of the one point block on the conformal on the torus. And once you have all of those, you in principle know how any conformal block transforms under any crossing transformations. And um, this was formalized by Moore and Seiberg in their CFT paper. And there are some bunch of consistency conditions that these Fs have to satisfy. And uh, but basically, so as far as I know, that they have not been completely proven. But uh, we basically assume from now on that this is uh, consistent. Okay, and in particular, what that means is that the Hilbert space carries some unitary representation of this um, of this mapping class group, and it's unitary with respect to this inner product. Also okay, so that's uh, essentially all known, but maybe from two different um, areas. And now I want to connect it to gravity again. Go back to gravity and this type here T T. Uh, or are there any questions? I hope I've been listening. So the, this fact that you only have the, the plane wave normalizable things was the things that we saw. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So far, you have not talked about the, the, the technology of 
no, no, I, I will do it now. Yeah. yeah, and basically, so so far uh, there was essentially nothing new. I think mm -hmm. the only new thing is like what the same product actually is. But, um, so are there some what are the natural operators? Yeah. Spaces. Um, I mean, it's gravity, so there are no local operators, but we can add boundaries. Well, not not local, but yeah, local. so so what you can do is like we're in the lines uh, in your surface, and people have talked about this. Uh, so you can take, for example, the expectation value, you can try to compute the expectation value of some length of the geodesic around the surface. You can compute things like that. Um, yeah, we haven't studied those, but you can do that. These are basically your operators. Or you can add a boundary, and in a boundary, yeah. you, you really have to, to make a hole in the uh, technical space, and then you have two components of the technical space. You have a component that's finite dimensional, in which you have, say, the length of the boundary, and then to that, you, sh you should attach a trumpet. Uh, in the trumpet, you can do um, well, if you morph is on one on the bigger end of the trumpet, or gauge transformations, and that gives you an infinite dimensional component that's universal, and that's what contains the diffeomorphism and the, mm, the boundary gravity. Yeah, so, yeah. but, but we, we won't need that actually. We can get around this. Uh, yeah, we don't have to discuss that sort of um, universe right, with boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Right, so uh, let me just uh, say it again because it's maybe not completely obvious, um, but or it is now obvious, I think. But uh, so it's kind of amazing from from the TQT point of view that H closes under crossing. So it was not kind of obvious. So what, let me just uh, recall what we did. So we started with S H Warchan Simmons theory, which we believe is a consistent theory, but we don't know how to quantize it. We restricted our phase space, kind of randomly from the point of view of gauge theory to one component. We decided to only quantize that component. We got some Hilbert space, and we saw that the Hilbert space closes under, in particular, crossing transformations, Okay, which is not completely obvious. If you take another component of this Teichmer space, it's definitely not true. But if you take some component in the middle and you do some crossing transformation, you land in other components. So it is very special that this happens. You have and, some subset which I can take? Um, I, I mean, you can take subsets in the sense that you could take different gauge groups. So if you if you start with say SHR transforms theory, you could take the subset that corresponds to PSHR. But apart from that, like, otherwise I don't know if any other constructions are working. Um, right. And so once you have something like this, basically you have the correct data to define a three D TQT. Because to define a three D TQT, all you need is some Hilbert space together with mapping class refraction. You'll see in an example later that this is enough. Um, this is enough data. To define this TQT. And yeah, as I said, so this TQT was first defined by Anderson and Kashev in the math literature, but they use in fact some very different definitions. So I'm, I'm like 99.9% .9 sure that it's the same T Q of T, but it's actually not completely obvious to, to relate the two um, because they do some different quantization of Tejmer space, some state sounds and so on. Um, and yeah, in the physics literature, the only paper that I know is this paper by Mikhailov. Um, and it also doesn't have like a super straightforward gauge theory description. I mean, you, you start with S torch and send, but then you somehow restrict to only one. Um, so it is, in some sense, as a torch and sense theory where you restrict your gauge fields. Um, okay, and basically, the way this works, to define a 3D TQFT, you do what Witten told us to do in usual transcendence theory, say SU2 transcendence theory, you do like, surgery and manifolds, but, um, but you need to be more careful about infinities, essentially, because uh, the Hilbert space is now non-compact, it's, it's infinite dimensional, so it sometimes can happen that some partition functions are just not, not well defined. So you, you define partition functions. And, and we'll see explicit examples later. Right, so this was this. Okay. Is there uh, still the frame anomaly? There is a frame anomaly, yes. Um, I mean, the central chart is continuous, so you can choose it to be multiple of 24 if you want. And um, okay, and now, so basically now I come to the main thing because it's still not completely clear whether this is related to gravity. I mean, it is, like, we kind of quantize the gravity phase space, so it should be related to gravity. But we still haven't dealt with one issue, 
namely uh, what I called the second issue here, we haven't divided by the mapping class group, so we should divide by the mapping class group. And I said, like, either we quantize it first and then divide by the mapping class group, or we do it the other way around. And uh, so we still have to do it, because we quantize before dividing by the mapping class group. And so the claim now is that if you want to compute a gravity partition function on some fixed manifold, so I fix the topology. So in principle, then to get the full gravity partition function, I still have to sum over topologies. Then what you need to do is you need to sum over all the mapping class group transformations of the boundary of that manifold. And you need to mod out, uh, I'll explain this in a moment a little bit more, uh, by the mapping class group transformation of the bulk. And then you need to take this type community to a key partition function. And you need to act with this boundary modular transformation for mapping class group element, and you need to absolutely value square one. So first of all, this is where the Fermi anomaly, of course, cancels because we put that in right there. Um, but I should explain this, this part more. So in order, things should only depend on the boundary data, which is just some bunch of Riemann surfaces. If I, so for the purpose of ABCFT, we are very much interested in putting boundaries. So uh, I usually assume that these are, have boundaries. And uh, so this should just depend on the Riemann surface structure, which in particular means that I should sum over all the uh, mapping class group transformations in the boundary. So uh, for example, if we're just talking about thermal ADS3, then this mapping class group transformation will be all SA2Z transformations of the boundary. And we also say we should gauge out by the mapping class group transformations of the bulk. And so uh, the mapping class, if you do some mapping class group transformation in the bulk, it means it's some large diffeomorphism on the bulk, uh, which I allow to act non trivially on the boundary as well. In particular, it gives me also mapping class group actions to the boundary. And so I need to mod out by those because those I want to gauge. It can sometimes happen that there are mapping class group transformations that act trivially on the boundary. In this case, I need to divide furthermore by the order of these uh, mapping class group transformations that act trivially on the boundary. But usually, this actually doesn't happen. Do you always assume gamma can be extended uh, to a mapping class group action on the whole manifold? Um, no. No, because otherwise, uh, otherwise it would be the one. Yeah. Otherwise, it would be okay. trivial. But it's, here I'm a bit lost because first you, you started with uh, a canonical quantization. Yes. And then you had a Riemann surface, and then Techmuller, and then you quantized uh, yes. Techmuller times Techmuller. Yes. But now instead, uh, the a three dimensional manifold reappears. Yeah, yeah. So here it's important that M is now Euclidean manifold. Uh, whereas before we talked about phase space and so on, so we were in the Lorentzian signature. Um, but here, so we provide promote this to some TQFT which uh, is good to define on, on Euclidean uh, space times. And um, right, and so what this is computing is now it's the Euclidean gravity function. So maybe this step of promoting to the, the, the Yeah, I'm not saying that this is uh, like, it follows from what I said. This is but, a claim that we're making and we're providing evidence. So, but how do you promote it with the TQFT? Um, so, so you do surgery just like you did for chin semester. Uh, I'll, I'll do many examples in a moment, maybe they answer your question. If not, then uh, continue asking. All right. Um, any other questions? Uh, yeah, so one thing I should mention also. So if, if M is hyperbolic, so hyperbolic means it uh, supports some, some solution of the Einstein equation. It has constant negative curvature. Not all manifolds admit such a solution. Some don't, depends on the topology. Um, but if it, they support a hyperbolic metric, and the fact that it's known is that the mapping class group, uh, let me denote it like this, the subgroup of the mapping class group of the bulk that acts trivially on the boundary is finite. Because I said like there might be sometimes some, some part of the mapping class group that acts trivially on the boundary, and then we need to divide by the order of this one also. And, but the nice thing is about for hyperbolic manifold, there are very steep math theorems that guarantee you that this mapping class group is in fact finite. Uh, which is completely wrong in 2D, just to point this out. So, because in 2D, I could have some genus 2 surface, it's hyperbolic, this mapping class group is very infinite. Okay, It's very special to 3D that this happens. Uh, so in 2D, this, this proposal will be completely useless. Because uh, So in 2D, there's a complete analog of all of the story, where this is like this type of QFT becomes the F theory. Uh, you can compute things in the F theory, basically. Uh, but then here, the F theory computes the, essentially the volume of this type of space. And it will be completely useless because you still have to divide this in infinite. When m is not hyperbolic, what is the. When m is not hyperbolic, it can happen that it's finite. It can also happen that it's not finite. 
I see. Um, so this it's, I'm not saying that this, yeah, then sometimes this formula is useless. Right. Okay. Um, good. So I have like 20 minutes left. And I want to discuss a few examples. Um, all right. And we'll start very simple with something that is not. So let's take first M to be a handle button. Handle body means it's something like this. It's some three dimensional manifold that you obtain from filling in some Riemann surface. So, the most famous handle body is, is terminators. Like this. Uh, this is the, the handle body was discussed by uh, Meloni, I believe. Yes. Um, but, so, what is this TQFT uh, philosophy buying us? So, first of all, now this, this uh, what, basically what we need to compute, we need to discuss what all these factors are. So let's start with computing what the Teichmüller uh, partition function is in this case. So it's a partition function on a space with a boundary, which means by like standard quant uh, p theory that that a partition function is actually a state in the boundary Hilbert space, and the boundary Hilbert space here is a genus two surface. So that means that this partition function will be some conformal block on the genus two surface. Because basically what is expected from ADS CFT because it should transform like a CFT partition function on the boundary. Again, this is uh, T times T. Yeah, um, T times T, yes. I will ask the value squared in the end. Uh, well, the Y, right? Because, I mean, the 2T have independent moduli. It's not the one, the complex conjugate of the other. Uh, in this, no, they are. It's on the same surface. On this surface. Yes, right. there, there are other examples like the, the wormhole that would be my second example where it can happen that you have left and right more, more like different. Um, but in this case, it's the same. Model. Because in the canonical quantization, the two models are independent. There are two diagonal spaces. Um, so, yeah, yeah, but here, I mean, the physical interpretation is clearly you want some CFT partition function on the boundary. So the, mod, the modula are the same for the left and right. I mean, they're complex country. But uh, is this a state? I mean, is a statement an axiom of your theory, or uh, well, this I mean, this will produce a state in the boundary Hilbert space. So it is non-trivial in principle. So I decided when when we quantize, we said the phase space is t times t bar. We could decide and say uh, what we get is there are zero conformal blocks depending on some type of space, and then there are zero conformal blocks complex conjugate depending on some other type of space. Mm -hmm. There's no need to make it the same type of space, but it's just convenient. Use the same type of space for both left and right function. But in principle, you're right. We could so, but when you have a manifold M, uh, again, Zetek Müller is uh, a wave function on, on the boundary. So, this will be a conformal block in the boundary. Yeah, but still, I don't understand why there is a single Zetek Müller because you started with the. And I will absolutely value squared here. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is not yet gravity. This is before square. It's just the T squared for the TQFT. Yeah, this is the TQFT partition. Part. So, so the TQFT of yeah. a manifold M of a handle body is by definition a state, a state, a state in the boundary. Yes. Right. And the state, so it's some conformal block or some conformal blocks. <coughs> and the conformal block that it is, uh, is not just surprising, it's a vacuum conformal block in the boundary. And one way to see this, um, basically what Massimo was explaining before. So if you do the path and go on this handle body, then uh, what propagates in the boundary, what conformal weights can propagate here, are determined by quantizing on this uh, disk. Say. On the disk, uh, if you quantize on the disk, you get the vacuum uh, character of the resort, which tells you that everywhere where you have a disk that is contractible and above, you only can get the vacuum that goes through there. And so basically what you get is the vacuum character in the OPE channel that is determined by this handle body. The OPE channel is the one where you you have fancy conditions like this. So this gives you say, a, a vacuum. Okay, that's um, more or less by definition. And um, right, and then we need to discuss what is the mapping class group of the boundary. Well, it's just the mapping class group of the surface. Uh, or, uh, let's for this one. Uh, then let me pretend this is genus one example. For the genus one example, the vacuum block has some explicit formula. It's like the Q over minus C over 24 product from N to two to infinity, just to make it a little bit more concrete, Q to the N. So that's the vacuum character of on the torus. This is the result here. Here you get the genus two conformal block, which doesn't have a very explicit 
representation. And here, the snapping class group of the surface for the genus one case is just PSN2. Um, okay, and then we also need to discuss what's the mapping class group of the bulk. And basically, the mapping class group of the bulk in this case is generated by doing din twists along uh, these kind of this disk. So you can cut off the cut open the manifold there and twist once and put it back together. That's the unique the generator of the unique large gauge transformation. So this guy is isomorphic to Z in this uh, case. And so what you get in the end of the day is some well-known statement that the gravity partition function in this term ABS is the sum of SA to Z mod Z of the vacuum character squared. Okay, and the same works for any other genus uh, if you want. Is it more explicitly saying for genus two? Um, yeah, I'm not totally sure who I would attribute it. Uh, it has been stated various times in the literature. I don't think there's like a very explicit proof of this or something like that. Some even convert. That's another issue which we basically don't have anything useful new to say about. Uh, the sum does not converge in this case. Yeah. So you need to be careful what you mean by the sum. It needs to be regularized. Yeah, but this is not, there we have nothing new to say. And also the sum over topology. But then there's ambiguities in how you regularize. Yes, so yes. Where is that data encoded in this map? Um, <coughs> You mean this now? Well, I guess that's not quite what uh, you said. Well, here, I, I, so I'm, the only claim I'm making is like, I mean, there's some other question how you interpret this infinite sound, and in principle, so in principle, the bound. So knowing just the tech motor TQFT is not enough, and you need to be supplied with official data. Yeah, but, but I mean, there is a, so in principle, you need to write this, right? The gravity partition function is only function of the boundary of the manifold. Mm -hmm. You need to sum of all the bulk manifolds that have this correct conformal boundary. And for every such bulk manifold, you need to do the sum, mm -hmm. and you do this. So that's the precise relation. But I, I can't tell you whether the sum, in what sense, it makes sense or can be made sense out of. That's what you should. So I'll just talk basically about with that, the sum over manifolds. But it's not completely crazy the sum over manifolds because, for example, it's known that hyperbolic manifolds they can be ordered to their volume, since like the hyperbolic structure is rigid. In particular, the semi-classical action. Uh, it's strictly increasing, so you can order all the manifolds according to their semi-classical, to their on-shell action. And so there's some sense in which manifolds contribute less and less uh, if you make them more complicated. So it's not completely crazy, but I don't think we even close to understand this. Okay, so that was my first example. Uh, any questions on this? I think I have one more question. But, but what I was trying to say is that the, even before you do the sum over M, the sum over gamma, that still, I mean, that's already have issues. That already has issues, yes. So, uh, but it's, I mean, this, these are the same issues as were there before. I, I'm, I'm not resolving yeah, those. Same issues as before. Yeah, but I'm, what I'm proposing is like some more systematic way of, of yeah. finding out what your system over. Um, okay, so. Then, uh, I, next example, maybe this was the one that Massimo was alluding to because he wrote the paper on it. Um, what people sometimes call Euclidean wormhole. So, it is uh, the topology of some Riemann surface times an integral. The way you should think about it is that's a, I can say the reason I mostly draw genus two surfaces instead of genus one surfaces because Teichmer is based for genus one surface without punctures a little bit. So, um, so it's a little bit ironic, but the genus two surface is actually much simpler than the genus one is. Um, so in particular, in genus two, you have a hyperbolic metric on this manifold, whereas for genus one, you wouldn't have a hyperbolic metric. And um, so this has also, also been discussed a lot in the literature. So now um, let's start again, let's put again all these uh, pieces together. Let's compute the Teichmuller TQST partition function on this manifold. So this time, takes values in two Hilbert spaces, right? Now there are two boundaries. So this, this will be a, some element in H, thanks for H bar. So I, I'll call this H bar, because I would like to think of both, in, or, uh, both like there's an orientation issue, whether you complex conjugate or not. Mm -hmm. So it depends in what or way you view the orientation. So if you choose the orientation opposite, then one block should be complex conjugated with, with respect to the other block. So, um, and now the two moduli here and here have nothing to do with each other. So there's no reason to take them to be the same. Um, okay, so what is this in a, from a TQFT perspective? 
Basically, imagine having some three manifold. You're cutting it open along some genus two surface somewhere. You're inserting its genus two surface times an interval, and you glue back. Topologically, you haven't done anything, right? Um, and so, what this uh, corresponds to is basically the identity in TQFT. You can also view it as a propagator in TQFT. So, it doesn't do anything. It's um, you can view it as a map from the Hilbert space to the Hilbert space, and from the, for that map, it will be the identity. And so all this is doing is some complete set. So what we have to do is to insert some complete set of states and build up the identity. So this will be like some kind of, uh, it will be an integral, but let me write it like this, over all normal blocks, uh, normalize the conformal blocks um, on, on the Riemann surface. And then we have kind of the conformal block like this, and then divided by the norm. Okay, but because the, we already know that conformal blocks are kind of orthogonal, but they're not orthonormal. That's why I'm not writing in more general. And uh, by the norm, so because of the delta function, what this actually means is uh, you should integrate over uh, like the piece of the internal piece. Then you need to put uh, the this one conformal block you view as left moving, one conformal block you view as right moving. So that would be the uh, conformal block depending on all the moduli and these keys and you know, there will be the right moving one and these can be different moduli there's no reason why they're the same and depending on the piece this is the complex conjugated one and uh, then you need to put in the, the norm and what if you see what the norm is what it does is to put structure constants it uses these structure constants so you put c0 of like every so you do some pair of pants decomposition of your uh, surface for every pair of pants, you put a C0. So then for the genus 2 surface, there are four C0s. Because the genus 2 surface, you cut here, here. Sorry, that's, that's wrong. Two zero. So you cut it here, here, and here. So you get two pair of pants. For every pair of pants, you put the corresponding C0. And then you also need to put uh, row zeros for every uh, everywhere you cut it. So there will be three row zeros in this case of this three, P1, P2, P3. And uh, if you look at this, what this is, is precisely the conformal block expansion of the Liouville partition function. So these are precisely the structure constants in the CFT, and these are the conformal blocks. The only weird thing is that the left moving conformal, the left moving uh, moduli are not necessarily the same as the right moving moduli. But it's still true that this is like the Liouville partition function, depending on M and M tilde. Okay, uh, and maybe this was expected, something like this, because from a TQFT perspective, again, this is like if you do condensed matter in transcendence theory, you, you view this as edge modes. And basically, what you do by, by taking, say, free boson and you promote it to U1 transcendence theory and you separate the two ends, uh, then you can like promote it to a TQFT like this. But if you just squash it back, you, what you get is a 2D CFT partition function. So you need to get a 2D CFT, and it's not. It's not too striking that you get the with theory in this case. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you would do this for SU2 transcendence, what you would get here is the SU2 WGW partition function. Okay, uh, and then I also need to tell you what the other ingredients are, but they're kind of easy. So the mapping class group of the boundary will be this mapping class group of sigma squared, because you can have, yeah, there are two sigma is boundaries, and the bulk one is, is just one mapping class group of sigma, it's the diagonal one. So what you do at the end of the day, to compute the gravity partition function in this, in this one hole, it will be the sum over some principal gamma runs over mapping class group times mapping class group modded out by the diagonal mapping class group, but we can just write one mapping class group that only say acts on the left one. Um, then you get the hole. And then you get the left moving moduli are acted upon uh, by the mapping class group element, but the right moving ones are not. And then you have some square. Um, okay, is it clear what I mean by this formula? So, in particular, for the torus, something like this was written down by Kotler and Jensen. Uh, but for the torus, this is actually a little bit subtle because you need to talk about the liberal partition, liberal partition function on the torus. Um, but, and, and for like, uh, there was also a paper two years ago by Collier, Chandra, Hartman, and 
uh, Maloney, where they did this for like three punctured sphere and things like that. So if you do it for the three punctured sphere, you just get the DOCC structure from the sphere. Um, all right. Any questions on this? So uh, will you give other examples? Yeah, there will be two more. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So, so these are kind of still known, I think. But, yeah, but if, I, if we were machines and we needed, uh, let's say, some instructions on how do we see what would it be? Uh, right. OK, one, one, one answer I can give you if, uh, is, so if you have any manifold with any number of boundaries, uh, let, but let me not put words and lines at that, OK? Uh, then it's known that there's a so-called Higar splitting of the surface, of the manifold, which means that there, you can write every manifold like this. Um, let me make this my third example. Uh, you can take like a handle body one and a handle body two. They might be of very high genus. So this is first a case without boundary. And you identify them along the boundary, but possibly with some mapping class group twist. Okay. Uh, is it clear what I mean? Like you take some, let's say, torus and another torus, and you identify them in the boundary, but you do some S H Z for it. And does it work also if you have multiple boundaries and you don't identify, identify all the boundaries, so you're still yes, left it, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it. Yeah. It doesn't work. Um, so, so if you do this, you always get closed manifolds because there's no boundary there. And what this does is basically on this handle body, you're producing a vacuum block. Then you need to find out the correct, uh, let's say, U of gamma, the correct. Like it will be some product of these f's and uh, s's, which are the ones for the torus one-time function, and uh, then you act on this vacuum block on the right. And uh, if you make this complicated enough, it turns out that these inner products actually do exist. Um, so if you would put this to be the trivial one, then the vacuum block is not normalizable, so this wouldn't work. But uh, if you make it complicated enough, we have examples where it's actually fine. Um, okay, so this is the case without boundary. With boundary, you can generalize it. What you need is you need to replace one of the handle body by so-called compression body, which means that let me draw some genus. Uh, I guess I need at least genus three compression body. So um, this will be a genus three handle body. For compression body, you kind of drill another handle body inside out. So I hope you can more or less imagine what this means. So you kind of drill out here like this. I think you talked about something similar in the talk that you get. Um, but so if you would drill all a genus three surface, then this would be the same as this one hole. If you would not drill at all, it's a handle body. So it's something that interpolates between the, being a handle body and this one hole. And okay, you're avoiding drilling a torus. I'm right? avoiding drilling a torus because a torus. So one issue is that is if you would drill a torus, it can never be hyperbolic. And uh, if it's not hyperbolic, uh, this is much more subtle. So the torus we don't understand particularly well if you don't put punctures in the torus. Um, right. So but this one does uh, uh, can be hyperbolic, and so this one is still very easy to compute using the same logic. So now you again need to insert. Basically, every time there's a, it's drilled out, you need to insert a complete a set of states here. Every time it's not drilled out and the disk is contra contractible, you just get the vacuum. Bit. So this is some kind of Double partition function, but where you only sum over sum of the internal states. Mm -hmm. And so now what the generalization of this statement is, is that you can say take another genus three handle body and you glue it in the boundary with some twist. And in this case, you would have created a manifold that has a genus two boundary. And uh, you can generate any manifold with any number of boundaries like this, because you could have, say, make drill like some disconnected number of um, handle bodies or something. Um, so that's a theoretical framework, uh, how to get any, any answer that you want. It's not always the most practical one. This shows at least that this completely works. Okay. Uh, while I clean the board, any other questions? So in this case, with, in, in, where you, you have a compression manifold, or I mean, when you drill some manifold, say that you, you give an example, I mean, suppose that you have a genus four, and then you create two genus two surfaces, but they are disconnected. So yes. yeah. this, I think, that in at least semi-classically, will not be a possible topology change in transition, right? Because you have a, a you have on the outer surface you have a holonomy that, that is, should be negative, right? Because you are in a hyperbolic mm -hmm. manifold, and instead contracts to zero. But instead here you do have a non-zero um, result. Right? 
This one is on zero. I'm not totally sure. I so thought it does have a hyperbolic metric on it, but but you probably know that part better than I do. Um, so it, yeah, you mean that in the, in the bulk there could be no hyperbolic. I thought this one does have a hyperbolic metric as long as you don't put torus. If you put torus, you get a problem because yeah. But suppose it's same. If you have a genus four, yeah, indeed. You say that. So here there will be a non-zero result, right? For yeah, know, this one, this one without the torus is completely fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, yeah, um, we, we can talk about it later. Um, all right, so I want to mention two more examples, if time allows, maybe one. Um, okay, one that's maybe f physically more uh, like a new one is, um, it looks maybe a little bit funny, but it has some physical relevance because, so there's this proposal of um, Chandra, Collier, Hartman, and Meloni for the boundary CFT being some ensemble of CFTs. And what they compute is various, uh, like they have this kind of approximately Gaussian ensemble, but then you can start computing corrections to it. The sort of leading non-Gaussian correction uh, is, is, um, is given by the following manifold. So since it's non-Gaussian, I need to have four boundaries basically. And I'll just take it to be the simplest one possible. So I take them to be spheres, but for it to be well-defined, I take three uh, mark points in the sphere. And then I just connect them in the unique way that couples all four things together. Like this. Okay, so in, this is basically a three sphere. You take, you drill out four balls, and you connect Wilson lines like this. So it looks like a bit of a funny example, but it's actually quite natural to think about. And then I put p1, p2, p4, p3, and this I call ps, and this I call pt. So there are six. So the Wilson lines are labeled by conformal weights or by these little momenta, and, um, right, and so the answer will be. So I think I hope you agree that this wouldn't be completely trivial to compute from some some other uh, perspective. At least I don't know how to compute in any other way. But basically, what we're doing now is to do this. So we cut it along some surface, and the surface we're going to cut it at is this one. So we're cutting our manifold into two pieces, and this and both have four punctures as boundaries. So basically, the, now the partition function. The type number one on this will be the inner product of so here you're getting like the S channel conformal block. That's why I called it PS. Um, so let me use my old notation. So this is PS, P1, P2, P3, P4. And this is the T channel conformal block because now they're there like this. P2, P3, P4, P1, Pt. And if you're a little bit more careful, there is also normalization factors coming from the, the fact that we have boundaries here. So you, basically, if I have, would have two boundaries, I get this DOZZ structure constant. So we'll, this is what we figured out here in the Euclid and one hole. So make this, to make this correct, I need four Z zeros. Let me not put all this piece, but there are the four Z zeros associated with the four balls here. And so now this overlap, you can just compute because you know this one will be basically F times this one, where f is this horrible object here. So that's how we define f, if you remember. And so what this thing is, is very simple in the end. You just write it. And then you take the inner product using this formula that I gave you. So this will be t inverse, c0, p1, p2, ps, c0, p3, p4, ps. So two of the c0s are killed from the inner product. So you have two. And then you have um, this F, P, S, T, P, 1, P, 2, P, Okay, so it's fully uh, exactly. Uh, and the mapping class group in this case is just trivial. So this, if you square it, you immediately get it. So this combination of C, 0, and F has tetrahedral symmetry? Yeah, it does. Uh, that's actually a nice check, yeah. Uh, thing. Yeah, so so this one should have tetrahedral symmetry. F is not doesn't have tetrahedral symmetry, but once you multiply by the structure constants. Um, all right. If I have, like can get like three more minutes, is that fine? You can you can say it. no. <laughs> um, all right. So the last one. Yeah, yeah. Just for B. For B. Already at four. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Because I inserted <laughs> one. Because this one I didn't. Find. All right. Uh, and so this I will take just to have something non-trivial. I'll take the figure eight naught complement. I drew it correctly. 
This is the figure eight now. That's often called four one. If you take the complement of this in the three sphere, it is actually a hyperbolic manifold. And so M is the complement of this. So this is uh, four, one. four one is just uh, the usual notation. And um, so there, yeah, we compute it in various different ways, also to check the polynomial. But the quickest one I can tell you is basically uh, there's a nice fact that if you take and to have another construction, take like a genus one surface with one puncture, with a one puncture torus, and you fiber it over the circle. Um, so you do this times zero one, but then you identify a point, let's say x comma zero, you identify with gamma x comma one. So you twist, you identify the end with the beginning, but you twist first by some mapping class group. Now this mapping class group is just SA to Z, it's just the one on the torus. So it's very simple. And the fact is that if you take gamma to be st cubed, you get the figure eight not complex, which is not completely obvious to see. But what this means is that, just to show you a different construction, uh, this Teichmuller partition function on the figure eight not complement, you can compute now, since you have a structure like this, it's a trace over your Hilbert space of st cubed. So, um, does that make sense? Because we twist it by, if we would not twist, we just compute the dimension of Hilbert space. If we twist, we compute the trace of the operator that implements the twisting. Um, and S has a very similar, it's like the modular transform, is the transformation of the one function torus, which has some kind of similar formula. And T is just a phase, it's just the usual T transformation. And yeah, okay, I can write the explicit formula, I think it won't help very much. But um, but then you can we check those various things. So let me first finish. So if you have then the gravity partition function, turns out the mapping class group is D4, some dihedral group of order eight, which as promised it's finite. Um, and then you get this thing squared. There's no boundary to some. Um, so but this is one case where there's mapping class group in the bulk that X trigger down the bound because there's no bound. Um, so what was sigma one one? Uh, it's a one puncture torus. Uh, there's a one puncture you need because you have this force supply. So in principle, you can assign any conformal weight to that force supply. So if you assign like the conformal weight to be exactly at the threshold, exactly at c minus one over twenty four, this corresponds to having a cusp, which is usually what people think of as being a not complement. But you can make it even bigger than some sort of black hole horizon around that knot, or you can make it smaller than the knot would give a conical <coughs> defect. Uh, in this case. Mm -hmm. And right, so one thing that in particular we did then is some checks. So we, for example, checked that this reproduces correctly the semi classical expansion. So if you make the center charge very big, then this, uh, you can compute that partition function also semi classically. The leading term is like the volume of this hyperbolic manifold, and you match, see that it matches. And the subleading term we also match is like the one loop determinant on that uh, geometry, and you can see that it also matches. And so, on. so you can various, do various uh, non trivial checks. Um, but I think I talked long enough, so maybe I should stop here. And thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Is it the call and the figure? You're asking what, what it's good for? Like what, what no, can, you, can you calculate it here? I mean, you can. What's the computation you want to do? So, one thing that people want to do, maybe for BTZ black hole, is to put, um, so for BTC in principle, we know all the sol solutions that are, um, that is, have a metric, right, that are hyperbolic. It's just like the model transformation of thermal ideas. Uh, so there's nothing new in that sense. So, and I don't know whether we can compute any other manifold. So the problem is there are some manifolds we can't compute because they have infinite mapping class groups and they're not on shell. Um, so yeah, that's why we have, I don't think we, we, we didn't think about it. Multi yeah. centered version of the Yeah, like, I mean, people are, and like, they're in particular deciphered manifold. People want to compute. Them. But those do not have hyperbolic metrics. Exactly, so that's why it's kind of hard. But do you think there's a. I think that would be eventually an have. upgrade uh, to, to. I mean, we do know how to deal with some uh, manifolds that don't support hyperbolic metrics. Mm -hmm. But for now, it's not very systematic. That's it. That would require you to go. I mean, the problem with non hyperbolic metric, I should say, is maybe it's sometimes this Teichmuller TQFT partition function is not finite, and the mapping class group is also not finite. 
So sometimes you get zero over infinity, sometimes you get infinity over infinity, and sometimes you get infinity over zero over number, and then it's pretty clear that you get divergence. But it's, in this case, this is not completely clear what to do. But in all the examples you show here, that does not matter. All of those have actually a hyperbolic metric. But if you have a, a, a way of constructing a lot of <coughs> uh, black holes, uh, is just to have um, a, take a surface of um, time symmetry. Okay. You can be more general than that. You know. And then that one is a Riemann surface with a boundary, uh, infinity. Mm -hmm. So you have yep. a trumpet, and then you can attach whatever Riemann surface you want. And then, and then you evolve in, in time. Yep. So that would be um, uh, S1 times. Uh, this Riemann surface with a boundary. But if you want to compute the partition point. Um, yeah, yeah, so that one, but, but I mean, that's another way of viewing this one, right? Mm -hmm. So this, um, where is it? The handle body one uh, here. So this one you can view as S, also S1 as being a time to Riemann surface yeah. with a boundary, but you can also view it in the way. So, but you can also have surfaces that are more complicated than, uh, mm -hmm. because this one has two boundaries, but you can have uh, something that maybe it's not easy to see in, uh, with this picture. So you have really a Riemann surface, yeah. cut a hole, put a trumpet, mm -hmm. and then this is a t, t equal to zero. And then yeah. you have Euclidean time, right? So times uh, S1. So yeah. can you compute? So I think so, yeah, because with so. this you can compute it in principle everything. But I mean, sometimes this in principle can be pretty hard because mm -hmm. explicitly identifying some genus two mapping class group element is not kind of very easy. Because it's not as simple as the genus one where it's just SOT. Um, so it can be sometimes nasty, but I mean theoretically this gives the answer to any any such matter. One of your co-authors with Maloney wrote a paper where they argue that you have to go beyond regular space. Uh, so it's very problem. recently. Uh, so okay, that, let me say what they actually say. That, that's not quite what they say. So so they say if you take a conformal block, just a Gerzo conformal block, you expand it semi-classically. First of all, this expansion is some asymptotic series. So it doesn't usually convert. And second, uh, in, if you do this asymptotic series, then there are terms in that expansion that look like they don't come from quantization of tight heuristics. They look they, like they can correspond to conformal blocks when not all the states, say, are above thresholds and so on. So that, that's the claim. So, but I think that's not really relevant here because we're here we're not trying to, I mean, you want to, of course, uh, expand semi-classically to make contact with the semi-classical computation. And there you might need to deal with this fact. But if you, as long as you're fixed, uh, C. Um, because one way that they interpreted that result was to say that if you want to reproduce it with, uh, say, a H and Simon's theory and with a, a, a functional integral, then you have to include also other parts of uh, um, or other yeah. moduli that are not integral. Um, or in I thought or this reality. only is the claim in the asymptotic in the semi classical expansion. I mean, this TQFT is a consistent TQFT. You can check that it satisfies all the more cyber consistency conditions, even though they haven't fully been proven. I don't have any doubt that they're correct. Um, and the TQFT so is fine, but the, the step from going from the TQFT to to ground yeah. yeah, because they, I mean, the series can diverge, and then yeah, the, the the series you mean a series over gamma over the map. Yeah. yeah, but I think that's another issue than the one. It's a different uh, me issue mentioned in the paper. I yeah. see. Yeah, this issue we will always face. I mean, the, here we're just answering in a kind of more conceptual way what is the thing that you should sum over. So. I mean, there is some hope that like, maybe you can tame, like the, the, this divergence is kind of universal, uh, perhaps. But, and it's also not, so it might be that a genus two is actually nicer than a genus one, because many things are nicer at genus two than genus one. So sometimes a genus one can be a slightly deceptive. But, but the, nobody has attempted to run an witness for genus two. Yeah, I don't think. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, I mean, I think it's kind of a nice framework where we can start doing this. Well, not only with them, of course, you don't need it. You know, that's the back to go over. Any more questions for Laurie? If not, let's uh, thank Laurie.